Dr. Sia, nice to have you today. Good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Sia has been practicing family medicine in Quebec and he's also a member of Drug Free Kids Canada, our advisory council, so it's a pleasure to have you today. It's great to be here, thanks. So we were hoping today to talk uh, a little bit more about cannabis in an effort to uh, really provide um, good information for our parents to engage in rich conversation with their kids around cannabis use. And uh, you're one of our experts on the matter, so we thought it would be very useful for us to have this talk today. And if I may, I'd like to jump in with the first question that we often encounter when parents are um, sending us questions about cannabis. And mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about the differences between recreational and medical use of cannabis? What are the main differences, if you could highlight that for us, please? That's a, that's a very, very big question. And we could talk for hours on, on, and have a huge debate on whether cannabis is a recreational drug or is medicine. Uh, in my opinion, and everyone has a different opinion on this, I, I believe that cannabis is medicine, first and foremost. And it's been used as medicine for thousands of years. And we've known that it's had medical benefits. And we're starting to rediscover that after about 80 years of prohibition. And it's unfortunate because the research has really been thwarted by, uh, by, uh, by the effects of, of prohibition. And, but it, it seems clear that, that cannabis uh, has, is a powerful medicine, has medical effects at different doses. And we know that at small doses, it can be effective for, for example, pain and anxiety. And at higher doses, it has other effects. And, and then at very, very high doses, it has even um, more effects. Now, the, the fact that it's used recreationally is, is, in my opinion, due to the fact that it's, it, it does produce um, euphoria. It, it, it does produce some intoxicating effects, just like other medications do. I mean, morphine also is, is used for pain, but it does cause euphoria as well, and it has intoxicating effects, and people use it uh, for those effects as well, but it's basically a medicine. <clears throat> and, uh, and so when do we distinguish whether the person is using it for just purely recreational, trying to disconnect or trying to unwind every, every occasionally, or when is it used uh, for medicine, it, it can be a very daunting task. Uh, and there's, there's no real clear demarcation. Um, what I usually uh, tell my patients who I'm wondering if they're using it medically or recreationally, I look at it as if it's any other kind of medication. For example, if you have high blood pressure, you take your medication every day. If you have diabetes, you take your medication every day. If you have an infection, you take your antibiotics every day. So if, using, if you're using cannabis every day, that to me is a sign. If, if you're using it every day, to me, I'm saying to my patients, is this medication for you? Are you using this to treat a condition? And oftentimes they'll say no because they've never been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or seasonal affective disorder or ADD or any other number of conditions, bipolar disease. We know that uh, patients who have significant mental health problems use cannabis two to three times more than the general population. So we know that people are self-medicating with cannabis, but they often don't know it. And if they're using it every day, that to me is a clear red flag. I mean, you're treating something and it can start as early as 15 or 16 or 17 years old. They mean mental health problems don't start when you're 21 or 25. It start usually, they start at adolescence. There's these prodromal phases. So if adolescents discover cannabis when they're 13 or 14 or 15, and it becomes for them a significant coping mechanism to treat something and they're using it every day, this should be a red flag, not to accuse, okay, so you should stop using that, but says, hmm, maybe we should consult somebody, find out what's, what's, under, what's the underlying conditioning here that you're, trying to, that you're trying to treat. What I'm hearing from you, it's um, you're talking more about usage and going to the root of the usage. Why is the person using cannabis as opposed to the form itself? So when we're talking about recreational or medical, are we talking about the same drug basically but Absolutely. it depends on how the individual and why the individual is using it am i correct in in making that assumption yes yes absolutely because cannabis the dosage range for example is and this is a crucial issue 
cannabis and THC in particular, because we know the cannabis is a complex plant. This, it's not just one compound. Well, just for the parents that may not know, can you explain the THC and the CBD component? Yes. <laughs> Precisely. Thank for example, I, I like to compare cannabis to other medications that we're using. Okay, so if we're going to compare cannabis, which has an intoxicating effect and has also therapeutic effects, and if I'm, going to, if, if I'm going to compare it to morphine, for example, which has a bit of the same profile, it has therapeutic effects and it has intoxicating effects. Morphine is one single chemical compound that interacts with one single receptor in the body and has a very specific singular effect. Cannabis is not at all the same, is, is not the same drug at all. Cannabis contains over 500 compounds and there's probably over a hundred of them that have been studied either preclinically or clinically that interact with over 60 different molecular targets in the body. So we only know a fraction of what cannabis can do in terms of therapeutic potential. But there are two compounds that have been studied quite extensively, and that is THC and CBD. And when we say we're using cannabis for the intoxicating effects, it's not cannabis that contains CBD. It's cannabis that contains THC. And there are many forms of cannabis that contain so little THC that there is no possible uh, intoxicating effect. For example, uh, hemp, which is a, a, a cousin of, of cannabis, uh, produces a lot of CBD and less than 1% of THC. And we've known for hundreds of years that this, this does not cause any intoxicating effects, but it can have therapeutic effects through the, through the CBD. So when people say cannabis is bad or cannabis causes intoxication, you have to be careful because not all cannabis causes intoxication. Certain forms of cannabis cause intoxications and other forms don't cause any intoxication at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, that clarifies. I know it, it, it gets complicated because cannabis is, is a, a plant that has, there are hundreds and hundreds of different varieties that have different ratios of THC and CBD and it's, it can be confusing for a lot of people. Well, thank you for helping us clarify that a little bit more for them. Um, so let's go back to self-medication. Mm -hmm. Do you encounter people that are using cannabis? And from what I'm hearing, I think the answer is yes, but to alleviate some of the symptoms when it comes to stress or anxiety, and they're actually not being diagnosed, but they're self-medicating to reduce the effects of stress and anxiety. And it's specifically in this time right now, in this pandemic, where you know, we, we know that people are incurring a lot more stress. There's no doubt. If you look at the, um, at, uh, the sales of uh, licensed producers, sales of cannabis has gone up uh, since the pandemic started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So people are consuming more. And although I don't have any statistics, probably I would probably, you know, venture to say that people are probably drinking more alcohol as well during the pandemic, you know, and eating more potato chips. <laughs> um, so, uh, so these are all coping mechanisms, I suppose. Now, if, if we, if, if the argument is like, well, let's compare cannabis to the other coping mechanisms that we have. <clears throat> if, if, if you were to ask me, uh, for adults, I mean, cause we're not talking about kids here between cannabis and alcohol, which one has the, 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 the least, uh, long-term negative effects. It, it's, it's difficult to argue that cannabis is more dangerous than alcohol if you're going to be using it regularly as an adult to alleviate stress and try to unwind. Okay, that's one issue. And that's probably the reason why it's become legal in Canada, because we've had this argument for 30 years. And it, the conclusion is pretty simple. Right? Um, but for kids, though, and for adolescents using uh, cannabis uh, to self-medicate, because <clears throat> this is the question that you've been asking, um, there is definitely there is definitely a, a, a risk that cannabis uh, will uh, help alleviate symptoms that are unknown by the person. I mean, people who are anxious uh, and anxiety is very pernicious. It, it people who have anxiety often don't know they have anxiety, but they just don't feel well. Okay, there's like it's a physical sensation. There's there's pressure in the chest. People feel tense. They, they're irritable, they have difficulty sleeping, um, they, have, they have difficulty concentrating. There's a whole list of symptoms that are associated with anxiety that are physical symptoms, and there's also psychological symptoms. People have ruminations, they obsess over certain things, and these, these, can, these can make for a very, very hostile internal environment for people. And, uh, and people, especially if you're 13 or 14 or 15 years old, and you have this, and, and as we know, you know teenagers are 
have difficulty in expressing their emotions. They have difficulty in, in articulating what's going on inside them. They usually keep it to themselves. You know, they keep it to themselves and they find mechanisms. Either they do exercise or they read or they dance or they play music or they become creative. And if one day they discover cannabis and if they tolerate it well, and they usually do, it can be a mind altering experience for a 15 year old to, to feel all of a sudden all tense and clumped up and suddenly feel this immense relaxation and a huge open space inside their mind. And for them, and that's, that's probably one of the reasons why uh, uh, the, the dependency rate in, in adolescence is so much more uh, uh, important than in, in adults because it does have a very, very powerful impact on, uh, on anxiety. And the danger is that they often don't know what is a um, what is an adequate dose. Now, we can talk also about the the risks uh, of using cannabis between the ages of say you know 13 and 25, and then right. after 25, this is another whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. I usually you know work with adults, okay, and and after age of 25, I'm saying okay, your brain is 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 completely oh, matured, yes. so right now there's no risks involved. But unfortunately, and this is the sad part, is that 80% of the, of, the, of, the, of the big users of cannabis, like the large consumers, are, are between the ages of 15 and 25. These are the huge consumers of cannabis. The ones who shouldn't be using it are mm -hmm. the ones using it the most, you know, in my opinion, because it does affect brain development. So there's no issue uh, uh, about that. But we're stuck with the fact that we can't stop them from using it. And we have to find ways of making them realize that they're using it as medication, you know, and that's, that to me is, is, is the, the goal is if you're using it every day, if you need cannabis every day to cope with reality, to cope with the fact that life is difficult and life is difficult for everybody. But if cannabis has become a way for you to cope with the difficult reality of your life, we need to talk about that. Okay. We need to talk about other ways. So what I'm hearing from you is even reinforcing what we were talking about with the first question, but really it's one thing to discover that your kid is using, but it's really to go back and, and discover why they're using, how they're using it yeah. and digging a little bit more. So if you are in a situation of self-medicating because they're alleviating symptoms that could be alleviated in another form, it's your role as a parent to talk it through so that you can find maybe healthier coping mechanism for them. Absolutely. And, and, and the, the most common diagnoses, mental health diagnoses in adolescence are anxiety issues and depression, right? I mean, these are schizophrenia and, and these really and bipolar disease. Those usually happen a little later in life and they're pretty dramatic. But depression and anxiety goes by completely unnoticed in a lot of teenagers. And these are the ones who end up liking cannabis a lot because it does offer them this opportunity to reduce dramatically these symptoms for a short period of time. And it's, it's, it's difficult to get a teenager to see a doctor. It's even more difficult to, for a teenager to see a psychologist but if you can get the ball rolling, you know, by telling them, you know what, medication, you take medication every day, right? For, for, for an illness, okay? Just throw that out there, you know, for a teenager. Just, oh, if I'm using this every day, if I need this every day, maybe I'm treating something, you know, maybe I'm treating a condition. I'm not, not just using this just to unwind and have fun with my friends. Mm -hmm. Because if, they, if the teenagers are telling you, I'm using it because it gets, I get high and I like getting high. I mean, cannabis or THC in particular, because we're talking about THC. When you take THC at small doses, it can be effective for certain conditions. But if you take it at higher doses, it'll still be effective for those conditions, but you'll, you will feel euphoria and you will feel an intoxicating effect. Okay. And so even though they're saying, you know, what I'm looking for is the intoxicating effect, but in fact, it's also treating the symptom. Okay. Mm -hmm. And plus you get a bonus of having an intoxication and having the giggles and laughing with your friends and doing silly things and, 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 and having that, uh, that, those kinds of psychoactive effects. But it, it's, it's a package deal, you know, it's a package deal. It, it, it affects every different, uh, so many different physiological functions in the brain that you can't just say you're looking for one thing. If you, maybe you're saying that you're looking for one thing, but in fact, other things are happening. Okay, so we're really encouraging parents to dig a little bit further and have that dialogue and, and try to find out more. I know yeah. that sometimes it can be 
um, intimidating at first or, or you know, as a parent, you, you may get into a panic mode, really being able to say, okay, I'm going to take a breather here, even maybe taking a pause and saying, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, but approaching it with curiosity and approaching it with, yes. let's talk about this and let's see what, what can be done, um, I think is very useful. Um, we've been talking about teens, and um, we have come across some um, information that there are um, some parents right now that are using cannabis uh, without a prescription to treat kids. So not so much like a parent and himself or, or herself making a decision to um, provide cannabis to their kids. I'm, I'm assuming more on the CBD side, but yes. on the medical aspect of it to treat kids. Um, I'd like to ask you, are there risks associated with that? And, and uh, if you could expand a little bit more on that new trend that, that we heard about and, and validate whether or not it's actually a trend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you go on the Internet and, uh, and you read up and just type up cannabis and um, autism, okay, you'll find dozens and dozens of websites that uh, are very um, convincing. In, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of trying to uh, <clears throat> promote the use of cannabis for the treatment of this specific uh, condition. Now, uh, some parents have been trying it for ADD and other conditions as well, but autism is, is really, or autism, autism spectrum disorders is, um, CBD especially has become extremely popular. Now the studies, if you look at the number of studies out there that have been done, I still haven't found a re one really good study that has been done with CBD <clears throat> and autism, but I've had parents tell me that it does help. It does help. Um, now the problem is uh, treating, treating kids with, with cannabis, even if it's only CBD, mm -hmm. uh, there is still a bit of THC in there. There's no such thing as cannabis without THC. There's okay, always that's, a bit that's of important. THC. I'd like to reiterate that. So yes. when people are always saying, I only THC. take medical cannabis, so I shouldn't worry because it's only CBD. What you're saying is there will always be traces of THC. There so will always be traces of THC. Now, some varieties have more than others. And uh, the, the good news is that here in Canada, we're very lucky because all cannabis products are certified or standardized or tested so we know exactly what's inside the bottle. Uh, so the labeling accuracy here in Canada, we're probably one of the only countries in the world that has this right now. In the States, it's a huge issue because uh, there's no, uh, there are no government standards. So whatever is in the bottle has probably nothing to do with what's written on the label. So in that sense, we're lucky. But there is always some uh, THC uh, in these bottles and is that THC uh, significant enough depending on the dose to have long-term uh, negative effects I can't answer that question we don't know if there's a safe dose of THC in kids all we know is that THC high dose THC especially when you look at the long-term negative studies in these chronic cannabis users uh, we know that there's long-term effects in terms of brain development and pruning and all that but these have been sh sh shown with, um, with teenagers who use high doses of THC without any CBD. Now, mm -hmm. is there a sweet spot where you can find this ratio of CBD and this amount of THC will not have an impact mm -hmm. in the long run in terms of brain development? Well, maybe one day we'll find out. Okay. We don't know yet. For the time being, we don't know. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we don't know. But it would be so wonderful if we did know, and if there were studies underway to test kids with different um, levels of THC and different levels of THC CBD in, in the long term. But these are studies that are very ethically difficult to do, you know, exposing kids to different ratios of, of THC. That's a good point. Um, yeah, it's and 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 a, and a controlled in a controlled environment. Man, I, I don't think any any university would agree to to mm -hmm. sign this off in their on their ethics committee. Uh, but it's being done as observational studies, and and we're lucky because in Canada right now, teenagers are getting access to legal cannabis through their cousins and sisters and brothers who are like you know are finding it in their in their parents' uh, cupboard, and uh, and we can we can detect the amount of CBD and THC that they're using. <coughs> Because we can we can we can detect it like in the in the hair samples or blood tests, and down the road we'll be able to see if there's a pattern. 
that's that's developing. But for the time being, uh, we still don't know. My gut feeling is that if your kid is taking a high dose of CBD and probably has less than one milligram of THC a day, or maybe two, it, it's probably safe. Now I'm throwing that out there without really any hard data behind me. Uh, and at the same time, if you're using it to treat, for example, uh, an incurable illness like autism spectrum disorder, well, you know, if, if your kid is being exposed to one or two milligrams of, C, of THC a day and maybe 50 or 100 milligrams of CBD, would I be extremely worried about that? Probably not, because I know that it's a long-term condition that it really doesn't, there's no cure for it. But if you're treating your kid for ADD, with, with cannabis, and I know it's, and, and ADD and cannabis is very popular as well. A lot of people claim that uh, cannabis can, can help with ADD. I don't believe that at all. I think it's, it's, it's too, um, I think it's, um, uh, the, the, the margin of error in terms of dosage, yes. cannabis is, is so narrow mm -hmm. that uh, if you're going to be treating somebody with ADD with cannabis, there's it's almost impossible for you to find that right dose every single time. There's going to be times you're going to be overshooting um, and you're going to be taking too much THC and then that'll have a negative effect. I mean, it'll, that'll, that'll actually worsen the condition. Mm -hmm. um, so in my opinion, there's many other options to treat ADD that are extremely effective and have been tried and tested. So stick with that. Okay. And, uh, Cannabis, ADD, not an issue, not, not, not an option. I think that's extremely helpful um, as information. I think that it's, it's a further incentive to not take those decisions for yourself when we're talking about self-medicating, like talk about it with your family um, practitioner, talk about it with health officials that, that can help you either uh, like confirm symptoms and confirm prescription for those symptoms and don't take it upon your shoulders to make those decisions specifically for kids. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to, you need to be, you need to, to follow the professional's advice, you know, and if you're not happy with one professional, go see another professional. Okay. But get, get another opinion. Uh, but, but take it upon yourself to self-medicate. <clears throat> the risk, the risks are really too high. The risks are really too high. Well, thank you so much. It's been um, my great pleasure, and uh, I learn every time I talk about this. So I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share this information with parents. I'm sure that we could have talked about it for another half hour, so oh. maybe that's something that we'll do again in the near future. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Sir. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.